Um, so we're going to be in the book of Luke for the next four weeks leading into Christmas. And we're going to start right off at the very beginning of the book of Luke. So if you have a Bible, feel free to open right away just to, to Luke 1. And primarily, I'm going to stick in Luke, and uh, I will have some psalms that I'm going to include today and a, a few other references. But Luke is the, the bulk of where we're going to go. And I'm going to read a good chunk of this beginning of Luke, um, because sometimes it is just good to hear the Word of God together and let that be a blessing to us. And one of the things I want to talk a little bit about to get things started is, uh, you know, I came from a church that was much more traditional, so to speak, more liturgical is probably the little bit better term for, for it than traditional, and uh, where, where Advent was really celebrated, and Advent was the thing, and Advent was the focus. And if you come maybe from like a Lutheran background, I grew up Lutheran, if you come from a Lutheran background, you, you kind of get this Advent thing. If you come from more of a, a free Protestant background, you might be like, Advent? Well, what, 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 what's Advent, right? Well, well, Advent is the season, well, basically, this is not a, the official definition, but basically from Thanksgiving till Christmas is Advent. And it's something more than that, but the easy way to remember it is Thanksgiving after Thanksgiving lunch, all the way to Christmas dinner. You got Advent, right? Uh, it's the easy way. Uh, don't overcomplicate things, all right? But uh, the idea, though, historically behind Advent is, is that Advent cultivates the difficult discipline of waiting. Um, but that, 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 that waiting, that, that, that hope that we can find fulfillment when God draws near us in this season. Advent is supposed to be alive with a, a, a sense of, of restoration and a, and a stirring with us. We heard this in the song a moment ago. A, a stirring in us with a, with a hope of redemption. And, and part of Advent is that, that heavy longing for God to come and to rescue us and to bring us back to Himself. Now, of course, in our, in our culture, the, the Christmas season is, is so often associated with fast-paced hurry. And again, that, that again starts right now, right after Thanksgiving Day lunch. It's Black Friday, right? Uh, you, you know, it's a little bit better than it used to be. I remember, oh, 10, 12 years ago, uh, yeah, probably about that long ago, I remember my brother came for Thanksgiving lunch and then he had to leave. Why? Because he had to go stand in line at Best Buy for the next 24 hours so he would be the first person in line to buy a big screen TV, right? And he did. He stood out there in South Dakota weather for 24 hours to buy a television. I thought he had lost his mind, but that's beside the point. Uh, but, but that's kind of, the, the, our culture kind of fosters that. And it's the holiday rush, they call it, right? And inevitably with that, we, we, we feel the, the tension and, uh, of, of the impatience of the world, impatient shoppers, hectic schedules, people driving like insane people on roads that aren't ready yet, right? Um, it's, it's that press. But the, the Christian embrace of Advent is kind of, countercultural within all of that. It's an act of intentional patience. We wait. We hope. Resisting, resisting the urge to plow ahead faster than we need to. Waiting for that manger to come. And we, at the season, we enter into the, the story of Israel and we share with them they're longing for a Savior. So with that kind of as the backdrop of Advent, let's start again in, in Luke 1.1. 1, 1. And I'm going to just read, uh, I'll read through verse 4 here to start off, and then we'll get the rest of it in a little minute. And it says there, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, the most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Now, in ancient Jewish texts, it was a common practice for the, the writer to introduce their writing with a description of why it was that they were writing. And the, the story of Jesus here is already being told. Okay, Luke, Luke knows that. That story is already out there. And so Luke writes here to Theophilus, but to us as well, so that we can have a confidence in the stories that we have heard. And Luke, 
Luke tells us four different things about his work before he tells us why he writes. First, he says he has investigated the story. I mean, that is, he's, he's been following the story closely. He's taken a, a long and careful look at what he is about to tell us. And then uh, he, he says, I, I went back to the beginning. And that's why, as we'll see today, Luke goes back, actually, before Jesus to the start with John the baptizer. John was a, a forerunner to Jesus, one who came to prepare the way for the Lord who was to come, the one who points to Jesus. And then third, he, he was very thorough, he says, in having studied everything. And this is undoubtedly why, if you've studied Luke, you'll know in Luke there's about 30% new material. Matthew and Mark, enormous overlap. Luke has a little bit of unique stuff, about a third of it. You get to John, John goes off and does his own thing most of the time. Uh, that's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptics, which means they're, they're similar. John's the weirdo. I love the book of John, my favorite book. But John's the weirdo, right? He's over there doing his own thing because he's got a different story. Not a different story, but a different perspective with a different focus, with a different reason. And so Luke is telling us his reason. And, and, and among that, this is why there's so much fresh material in Luke, is that he's really deeply investigated it. He, he went to people who, who literally experienced these things with Jesus and, and, and shares those then with us. And then Luke tells us finally that he worked carefully, taking great care to develop his orderly account so that he could tell us the story clearly. So on to Luke uh, 1, 5 through 25. And I'm going to just read that here and, and, and listen and absorb the Word of God as I do that. It says, The birth of John the Baptist foretold. It says, In the day of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he and his wife, he, let me try that again, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God and his division was on duty, according to the customs of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole of the multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John." And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For, for I am an old man, and, and my wife is advanced in age. She's advanced in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things have taken place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And 21 says, And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was a unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when, I, when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. This is the word of God. Amen. In the story of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth, we find a, a microcosm of the Lord, larger story of Israel, and truly of, of all of creation for that matter. There, theirs is a story that is marked by waiting and hoping. You see, for years they'd longed to have children, right? But they had finally come to terms with the harsh reality that, that their eyes would never see the fulfillment of this hope and that their hearts would never experience the joy of this longing. 
They, they felt like they'd been exiled to the desert of waiting. And they thought that they would never see this promise. That is the, the sense that marks for us the Advent season. It is a, a time of waiting, a time of longing, a, a season, though, of hope. In that season, we remember our separation from God because of our sin. And in that, our heart should yearn and ache for Jesus to come and deliver us. And we enter into this ancient longing of Israel, looking for the arrival of the promised Messiah. And just like Zechariah and Elizabeth, their hope waned in in this, this silence, this stifling silence of God. Would this ever happen? Would this hope of, of, for them having children ever become a reality? Now in the story, despite his disappointment, we still find Zechariah in worship. We see that in verse 8. He hasn't let his heartbreak become bitterness against God. He's in the temple worshiping, faithfully at work as a priest, when God breaks into his worship and reveals a miraculous message to him. An angel appears to him and and, and gives him this proclamation. He says, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Isn't this the, the great promise of Advent? Do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. We, all of us, were in desperate need of a Savior. And God heard our prayer. Advent is a reminder that that we serve a God who does hear our prayers and that He moves with compassion and mercy to answer them. So, what prayers do you have in your life that are unanswered? What longing do you have that is yet unfulfilled? What need, what what fear, what obstacle might threaten you today? The Lord says, do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Trust God to answer according to His will, His wisdom, and His love for you. Now a, a strange thing begins to happen when God begins to draw near to us. When Jesus shows up, life begins to stir in the most impossible of places. From from barren wombs to occupied tombs, it springs up where you would least expect it. And isn't it beautiful? Supremely beautiful that God fulfills the age-old longing of Israel by answering the prayer of a small but faithful family. He sets into motion, God does, this this amazing plan that will rescue all of creation. But he begins by simply answering the prayer of a single woman, Elizabeth. That's just like God, isn't it? Simultaneously accomplishing sweeping deliverance for a nation, but starting off with just a little miracle for a mother. Now despite this unfolding miracle that's happening right before his eyes, this, this thrill of the long-awaited news, Zechariah, when he hears this, he responds with a question, right? Zechariah says when the angel comes and speaks to him at the temple, he says, hold on, how can I be sure of this? Right? Can, can you imagine this, Really? Can you imagine this for just a second? Can you just imagine the angel standing there? He's next, you know, the altar's here, and the angel's to the right side. He's standing there, flames and light and the heavenly heavenly things going on all around him. And he's like, what more do you want, man? Seriously, angel? Right? Zachariah's like, how can I be sure of this? Angel! Angel! And then, not only that, but... Zechariah continues on and he, he, starts, he starts listing some obstacles, right? Some things that are going to keep it from being a reality. I'm too old. My wife's too old. I'm sure she appreciates him saying that, right? Um, that's not the kind of comment you want to make about your lady. If you, if you noticed, 
in the scripture. It says he was old and she was advanced. Read your Bible. God is wise. But as a result of this, of his asking this question, his ability to speak, which is kind of a big deal when you're a priest, right? Can you imagine me not being able to talk? All right, you get the idea. His ability to speak is taken away until this promise comes to pass. Now this doesn't mean that God punishes anybody who asks questions. That's not what this means at all. God, in fact, welcomes our questions. God is, God is big enough to handle whatever questions we might have. He's willing to wrestle with us. Don't be ever afraid to, to voice your questions to Him. He knows that we have questions. And in fact, questions are a sign that we believe that He might have the answers. In fact, if you know the story, you'll know about Mary, right? When, when an angel comes to Mary, when the angel, same angel Gabriel goes to her, he appears to her and, and she says, how will this be? Because I'm a virgin, right? So she has a question too. So what is the difference? I think perhaps in Mary's case, you have this, this young girl who's asking a very honest question, something about logistics, right? Even while in the midst of that, still believing God will do it. Still believing that this miracle is possible for God. In Zechariah's case, however, we have this, this seasoned priest. This is a man who is a leader of faith for the nation of Israel. And he wants to know how God can do this. Can you actually do what you're promising God? For Zechariah, it was an issue of trust. He was not sure that God was able to do the impossible. But if Advent teaches us anything, it's that God is in the business of bringing about the impossible. After generations of waiting and longing, hoping in the darkness, Advent is that first little sign of dawn as the sun is about to crack the horizon. We see that, that God is on the move, that the impossible starts to become commonplace as He draws near to us. Now when I read my Bible and when I begin to think about waiting, waiting, right? As I think about waiting, the, my mind goes back to King David. David back in the Old Testament, right? While he didn't always get everything right in life, we know that David was a man after God's own heart. So let me read to you a the first little part of Psalm 40 that captures us. Psalm 40 verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard me cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You, you have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None. None can compare with you. And David finishes that part and says, I will then proclaim and tell of them these great deeds that you have done. Yet they are more than can ever be told. Now as I, as I read that, did you hear those very first words, right? David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. How many of you are naturally patient people? Yeah. Yeah. One, Dan, we got one. And he is a farmer, and I think patience does come with farming. So he may be telling the truth. I'll, I'll trust you on that one, Dan. Most of us, though, myself very much included, we're not naturally patient. And I don't, I don't imagine that David was naturally patient, right? In fact, his life set him on a path exactly towards the opposite of patience. Think about it. Leadership military, being king, all of those things do not lend themselves to being a patient person because he's in charge, he's in command, he's the boss, and he gets his way. So he doesn't have to always be also patient. Yet, 
David developed the ability to wait. And we can all do this as well. We can all get better at this. Patience. Waiting. That's the opposite of the way of the rest of the world. We want things done quickly. And, 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 and continually, we have new devices that enable this, right? I mean, I remember, I grew up right before the microwave age, when that didn't exist. And then when I was young, we were poor, so we couldn't afford a microwave. I had a bunch of aunts that worked for a company called Litton. Anybody remember Litton? Yeah, microwaves, right? And so, I had family and friends with them, but we didn't have one. I thought they were pretty cool, though. And continually... Things keep advancing and we get new things that spring up to meet our demands, that encourage our impatience because it gets stuff done faster, right? We're no longer used to waiting. And the more our technology caters to our immediate desires, the less we are willing to wait. And so such is our our dilemma then as Christians. While society makes every attempt to make our life easier and faster, God works in a very different way timetable. In his mind, nothing is wrong with waiting. In fact, waiting can actually be a positive, a good thing, something that God actually uses, something that God is using to make us become more like Christ. Something actually happens to us while nothing is happening. You see, God uses waiting to change us. Unfortunately, though, we don't start out willing to wait, most of us. Our our natural response to waiting is often anger or doubt. But fortunately, God is gracious and merciful. He's understanding of our tendencies. Simply feeling deep, complex emotions in waiting, especially for significant things like a a pregnancy or a job or even kids waiting for Christmas presents, that, that, that feeling is not necessarily a sin in and of itself, but those emotions can take us places that become sinful. We can decide to exalt the feelings, or we can begin to act on things by taking matters into our own hands, right? Or perhaps maybe we won't act, but maybe we'll make an idol out of some things. Oh, this is one that hits close to home for many. You might not realize it. But we're waiting for somebody to get their revenge, right? We're waiting for for something bad to happen to that guy who did me wrong. I'm waiting for somebody to gossip about her who gossiped about me. I'm waiting to get some dirt on them because they told some dirt about me. I'm waiting to get them back. And boy, I can't wait. Right? And we become so locked up, making that thing an idol in our lives, so focused on it that it can consume us. I've seen it. I'm sure you've seen it. And so every day that passes is another log on the fire of bitterness and impatience and ingratitude. Perhaps even resentment against God. God, why didn't you get them? They did us wrong. Why won't you give me what I want when I want it? So what can we do then as Christ followers to grow here? What are the keys for us to be better at waiting? I think there's two things. Two simple things, but two difficult things. And it's humility and trust. I think the first key is humility. Sometimes when I've found myself getting impatient, when I find myself getting upset, it's then that I will remind myself that God is the one who put me here. My life is not my own. And in this, realizing this, is humility. It's coming to realize that we are just a breath and that God owes us nothing. And then the second key is trust, as I mentioned. Trust means believing at least two things about God. First, that He is powerful. And second, that He is loving. 
Believing that God is powerful means that we know that He is in charge of what's happening. Things are not arbitrary or, or out of His control. He is capable both of helping us and of changing things. Much of our anxiety, it comes in the waiting because we forget that God is able to make grace abound in you. You are not at the mercy of your circumstances. And then believing God is loving also means that there is a care, there is a, a purpose behind the things that He is doing. It means that He is faithful to help us right now and will bring blessings to us later. It means that His judgment and timing is always perfect and good. That He owes us nothing, yet He has promised to give us everything that we need anyhow. And so, even during long stretches of silence, God cares deeply for us. And we can be just like David and remind ourselves, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Sometimes in waiting, we're right where God wants us. Exactly where He wants us to be. And while that isn't always easy, if we're willing to lean into that, if we're willing to trust that God is working all things for the good of those who love Him, if we're willing to surrender ourselves to His timeline for our lives, to surrender to His will for our lives, then within that, we'll see a deepening of our faith. Growth, deep spiritual growth, comes as we wait with eager anticipation. Christmas time is a perfect time for us to grow in this area. God invites us to trust in Him and His goodness today. Trust in His faithfulness that He will be with us tomorrow. Relinquish control to Him and experience His love and His peace. And as we do that, it unites our hearts with His. It creates a maturity in us. It, it develops our character that we can take with us into the future. And it will enable us to even more enjoy His future blessings all the more. Whether we are like David or Elizabeth or Mary or Joseph or Zachariah, we can all become better at this. But we have to work at it. And if we will work at it, we will reap the benefits of drawing closer to God. Folks, we follow the God of the impossible. And I fully believe that God is on the move. So wait on Him. Amen? Let's pray.